Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this presentation uh, on the outcomes of the Aged Care Quality and Safety Royal Commission. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Luke Geary. I'm a partner in the not-for-profit and social enterprise team out of Brisbane, and I'm joined on camera by my two partners, Vera Visific and Louise Cantrell from our Sydney office. Um, we're going to present this session to you all um, in uh, three equal parts. I'm going to kick it off and then Vera is going to um, take control uh, from her perspective and Louise will conclude the session. Uh, we've got a lot of people on the call and I'm sure people will continue to join. For everyone's benefit, we are recording this, so if you have colleagues uh, or others that you think might be interested in the session, we will circulate a link to the recording and also to the slides as well as a copy of all of the recommendations made by the commissioners in their final report, as well as a copy of the summary of the four odd thousand pages that we have uh, been intimate with in the last several days. Um, I guess um, the first thing to note is um, we're going to be talking about different aspects of the report uh, which each of us have prepared. Of course, um, this is uh, a, 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 and hopefully uh, an engaging topic for you all. And if you do have questions, feel free um, towards the end of the session after we've presented the pre-prepared material to uh, come off mute and um, we would welcome those questions and we'll do our best to answer them. So without uh, further ado, uh, okay, so I'm going to begin just by painting a bit of uh, a scene as to where we are in terms of Australian society and issues regarding quality and safety for our aged population. This, of course, is not the first substantial uh, inquiry into aged care. And in the issues paper that was considered by the Royal Commission in late 2019, there was reference to some 42 prior reviews into aged care in Australia since 1981. That's an enormous amount of time spent by specialists across the field in making recommendations and considering issues as matters develop. And unfortunately, as will be evident from the tone of some of the comments from the Royal Commissioners uh, coming out of their report, um, it appears that most of what has happened in the past has simply been repeated over and over again in many of those reviews, and there hasn't been any substantial take up. Just because we've got so many people on the call, if anyone is um, on the call and not on mute, that'd be great if you could just put your microphone onto mute, please, so that we don't have feedback. Um, the report contains 148 recommendations. Each of Vera, Louise and I are going to take you through a couple of the salient ones uh, with respect to each of the areas or, or the themes of the report that we've been most focused on. My areas are funding and uh, some of the technology aspects that are identified in the report. Vera is going to largely talk about governance because that certainly is her specialty. And Louise is going to talk on resources and, and she's going to conclude the technology aspects that I'll start on. Um, I suppose one of the, the, the key warning signs coming out of this report is the actuarial work that was done by the commissioners and those experts which appeared in the public hearings and the, the research that was done by the Commission staff. And it, 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 it really does suggest effectively a tidal wave of the number of Australians who will be uh, 85 years and older in less than 40 years. So we've currently got 515,700 uh, individuals who fit that uh, age criteria, which equates to approximately 2% of the Australian population. In just 40 years, that will almost double. And the message, the theme coming out of the report is, if we're not uh, accelerating our preparedness for that, then whilst we've read about various um, uh, other than satisfactory outcomes in various media sensationalist articles throughout the course of the Royal Commission, um, if we're not prepared for that wave of additional Australians who need quality care uh, now, how are we going to be prepared for it then? Um, pretty uh, clearly, some of the uh, conclusions that were reached by the commissioners are around an understanding of things that aren't necessarily commonly discussed within Australian society. And they make a number of very clear statements. And one of them is that with age, 
uh, being advanced, uh, certainly frailty is as well. And they say that um, older people are more likely to have comorbidity. Uh, and as the population increases, more and more people are expected to have memory and mobility disorders. Now that's coupled with uh, some information I'll come to in a moment regarding uh, particularly the issue of dementia. Uh, in 2019, there were 4.2 working age people, and this is obviously uh, part of the uh, matrix of concern for what the system is going to look like in less than 40 years. In 2019, there were 4.2 working people uh, for every uh, Australian over the age of 65. So there's going to be less people by a significant number by 2058, amounting to only 3.1 working people for every Australian aged over 65. So where we're seeing an increase in uh, the population requiring uh, aged care support of some kind, uh, we're going to have a greater difficulty funding it because we're going to see a substantial decline in those that are financing the uh, sector. Not only will it be an issue for those that are financing the sector, but as Louise will touch on, certainly the workforce will substantially also decline uh, in being able to service the demand for services within the sector. Uh, to give you an idea of the total amount of money currently being spent in aged care in Australia, there's a, 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 a composition of some $27 billion spent in the year 2018 to 19, comprising basically four-fifths of that funding coming from uh, the Australian government, uh, from taxpayers, and the balance from uh, private fees paid by individuals contributing to their own aged care. The National Aged Care Workforce Census uh, and again, this is something Louise will talk on in some greater detail, just, but just as some statistics, the National Aged Care Workforce Census uh, survey found that there were approximately 366,000 paid workers and 68,000 volunteers, uh, together with a further 28,000 contractors servicing the sector in 2016. And if you factor in the demand is going to be effectively doubled and then some by 2058, then the workforce is going to need commensurate uh, increasing, of course. Concerning to the Royal Commission, concerning to many uh, individuals with uh, young people with a disability in their family or their friendship circles, concerning, I'm sure, also to aged care providers, is that there is a huge legacy within Australia of young people with a disability being admitted to residential aged care. The Australian government came out in 2019 and made some bold statements regarding uh, its commitment to reducing and indeed eliminating that being the case. But unfortunately, uh, the statistics speak for themselves and we still have a new cohort of young people with a disability being admitted to residential aged care in the very month, months before the final report of the commission was handed down. So. Not only is the Australian government saying that it's committed to getting those who are already in aged care out of aged care and in more appropriate uh, residential settings, but um, they haven't been able to stem the tide of the new admissions. Commissioner Briggs uh, acknowledged that at least one in three people accessing residential aged care or home care services have experienced substandard care. And those of you who lost a Christmas uh, several years ago in compiling uh, your response to the request for information from the Commission will have recalled the substantial number of substandard uh, care incidents that uh, each organisation was required to note. And that statistic of um, Commissioner Briggs really speaks for itself that 30% or, or greater than 30% of every individual uh, in residential or home care services has experienced what the Commission accepts to be a level of substandard care. And that's obviously concerning. Um, importantly, when coming down with their uh, indictment on the current state of the inadequacy of the Australian Government's provision of aged care, and, and, and take these comments, I think, in a way that's not intended to be placing the blame at the sole feet of the providers. The, the commissioners really are very clear saying the Australian government has failed to lead. And I'm sure when Vera talks about governance, she'll make that point in more detail. But the commissioners also said the approach that we've got to aged care 
doesn't start from the correct starting point. And they said, we, we basically really need to refresh this and we need to have what, we, we, what they were defining as a rights-based approach, which guarantees universal access to supports and services uh, such that it fulfills the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, which is part of a United Nations Convention covenant on economic, social and cultural rights, which Australia ratified um, in uh, you know, more than 50 or just under 50 years ago now. The priorities that they um, called out uh, that dementia care should be core business for aged care services and particularly residential aged care. And they noted that uh, over half of the people in residential aged care have a diagnosis of dementia, yet they found that from all of their uh, submissions they received, from all of the evidence they heard in the public hearings, that there was a, effectively a woefully inadequate understanding of and ability through funding and appropriate um, structures to provide the necessary support to individuals with dementia uh, and they were so concerned uh, about that and particularly the skills and the capacity required to adequately care for people living with dementia that that was one of the thrust of, main, of one of the main comments that they made. Um, they talk about um, dignity in uh, dementia, dignity in end-of-life care and they uh, found that the the sector was uh, unfortunately unable currently to meet the demand of that and they said that they heard examples where the care provided to people in their last weeks and days of lives was severely lacking and fell well short of community expectations. They analysed what they thought were the systemic problems with the system and effectively, um, no doubt Barry will talk about this on governance, but effectively there were two philosophies. Uh, Commissioner Pioni had one philosophy which I really um, took to be almost a scorched earth approach which was basically uh, tear it all up and start again and Commissioner Briggs was more of well there's such a sense of urgency in this issue that we can't wait to rebuild a structure we need to do everything we can now to catch up with the existing structure uh, and, and, and some of the recommendations really will require the government to choose uh, which of those approaches they wish to take up. And that, that all being said and the differences of their opinion, they were both in agreement about what they saw were the systemic problems. And the first and foremost was inadequate funding. Uh, the model was woefully inadequate in its ability to fund the level of care and services required by the people needing them. Uh, there was uh, variable uh, governance and behaviour uh, standards and there was an absence of system leadership and governance from the government. And that all led to poor access to healthcare. Um, one statement that came out uh, very clearly from Commissioner Briggs was really reflected uh, in the evidence that was heard in the hearings and certainly was a criticism of all of Australia. And she said that there was clearly a systemic problem of ageism within the Australian community that must be addressed. And you think that the evidence of that really is in those 42 earlier reports or inquiries that were conducted and yet a priority of fixing the system was never really uh, mandated by any of the governments uh, throughout that period. Um, effectively, and this is quite small to read, I'm sorry, but um, there were uh, a series of uh, criticisms regarding uh, the financial priorities of the Australian government and effectively that reflects the lack of um, I guess, acknowledgement of the, the, the severity of the issue. And they said that without uh, this has been done without sufficient regard to whether the funding was adequate to deliver high quality and safe care. And that effectively, um, you know, there, there was almost a um, swapping out of the priority of aged care, even from the main cabinet portfolios to being a junior uh, ministry. And that reflected the seriousness with which aged care was considered and um, effectively the, the result is that the current state of Australia's aged care system is a predictable outcome of these measures. Um, effectively uh, the analysis and the final um, tally is that the aged care system um, even compared to the broader health system is unfortunately well behind other sectors in its application of relevant technology including in, in, in having any actual technology strategy. Uh, they said that the result of that is that the sector as a whole is behind the research, innovation and technological curves. Um, I'll, I'll comment on uh, one of the recommendations in a moment about residential aged care 
uh, refundable accommodation deposits as being something that they've said was part of the problem uh, in uh, the funding model. Uh, but certainly in terms of what they found to be a priority, uh, the days of a re refundable accommodation deposit, uh, both from a consumer's perspective, but also from a uh, structural systems perspective, I think those days are very much at an end. They identified uh, seven uh, key essential outcomes for the future, and um, this is what they say the system should be designed for moving forward. And they said it must be a person-first system, uh, it must be one which has the individual at the centre. It must be simple. It must be easy for people to um, understand. Uh, fewer categories of care, fewer funding uh, complexities. It must be accessible. And there must be, uh, other than the My Age Care system, there must be human interaction because of the significance of the decisions that are made by individuals coming into the aged care stage of their lives. It must be done with human interaction for people to ask questions and have information properly digested based on their individual needs. Um, at the core of what they've said about the system, it must be one of universal entitlement. So irrespective of your diversity in culture, community, uh, finance, uh, ability or otherwise, it must be universally uh, available. It must be timely. Uh, it must have uh, people able to make choice of the setting in which they wish to receive care. And ultimately, it must be one which is inclusive, which embraces uh, the relevant recognition of diverse characteristics of individuals in a culturally safe and a trauma-informed way. And that led to uh, a pretty straightforward statement that I've said is um, subtly not unbold. It is that they recommend a revolution. And to see commissioners recommend something using the word revolution, I think particularly um, experienced, uh, one of them a, a senior judge, the other a senior um, government uh, bureaucrat uh, is not an understatement. It is a very significant calling out by them about what's needed, a sense of alarm. Uh, on the funding and costs of implementing the system, uh, importantly, and this will no doubt be part of the news cycle as everybody starts to actually digest the 4,000 odd pages, is that Commissioner Briggs recommends an increase to the personal income tax by imposing a levy, much like the Medicare levy, of 1% of taxable personal income. Um, that's the only way that she found that this system could uh, improve the necessary costs required in order to fund it to be able to catch up and be somewhat more fit for the future. Um, my top five recommendations are really uh, three of them, uh, well, two, two of them rather, as to data. Uh, one as to this issue about young people in aged care. Uh, and, and then the, the final two I'm going to talk about now briefly are as to financial in, um, imperatives. As to data, uh, and you'll, you'll have these slides, of course, the, the Commission has made a very clear point that the health system has moved forwards with embracing technology and understanding how to utilise data, uh, whereas the aged care system has completely lagged behind. They identified that most data within an aged care setting is either in multiple systems or even, sadly, for many of the providers they spoke with still in uh, written form on paper. Obviously, that's not going to be fit for the future, and they've set forward a plan for how that might have certain minimum national data sets, which are compatible both at a federal government level and a state government level, because, of course, we have the intersection between uh, state-run health systems and the Commonwealth-run aged care system. They said also that uh, my health record really needs to be universally adopted by the aged care sector and they've set out a uh, call for government to require that by the 1st of July next year that be uh, a commitment and that the Australian Digital Health Agency prioritise aged care uh, in order for, prior for providers to adopt the My Health Record system. As I said before, uh, this issue about young people in aged care is one that was particularly concerning and such that on the 25th of November last year, uh, sorry, two years ago, uh, the Australian government made a commitment that there would be no person uh, under 65 entering aged care from the 1st of January 2022. Well, you've seen the thousand that were in their new, the, the, the new 1,000 that went in there last year. Uh, one is concerned at whether or not the Australian government will be able to meet that commitment, but certainly the Royal Commission has sought to hold them to account for it. Um, 
that will of course require a degree of assistance from the National Disability Insurance Agency and um, and coordination with state government funding models as well. Um, my fourth recommendation relates to the oh, sorry my fourth highlighted recommendation relates to the issue about refundable accommodation deposits. Now the commission was clear that refundable accommodation deposits are not the future, and that funders, uh, as in uh, providers rather, need to be uh, weeding themselves off the use of refundable accommodation deposits simply because uh, they don't provide for appropriate uh, uh, support for the, the business model that is to keep aged care, but also because consumers are significantly uh, stepping away from them and instead paying various daily fees instead. And finally, as I mentioned before, Commissioner Briggs comments regarding the implementation of a aged care improvement levy and that that's to come on board as soon as uh, the 1st of July next year in the same form as the Medicare Levy Act. All right, that's the end of me. Vera, over to you. Thank you, Luke. I'm now going to spend the next 20 minutes or so looking at the governance recommendations contained in the report. And uh, as Lucas said, governance seems to be a big theme in the recommendations that have been put forward. And obviously, we don't have much time to go through all of them. But I'm going to adopt the same approach that Luke has. I'm going to pick up on the main themes and hopefully you get a sense of where the commissioners are going with all of this. So to begin with, the Royal Commission obviously found many systemic failures across the sector and the commissioners were of the opinion that many of these were caused by poor leadership at a board level and of course this led to substandard care. They've also commented on the fact that it was their opinion that the lack of expertise and accountability of directors added to this problem. So the Commission has made some significant recommendations in terms of proposed changes to governance and if I had to uh, try to identify themes in these recommendations, I'd say there are two themes. One is that it is much more people-centric approach. And I've spoken a lot about this in recent years, about the move or the trend towards being more people-centric, consumer-centric, customer-centric, stakeholder-centric. Really, we're talking about who exactly is it that we're trying to provide services to and how can we most appropriately provide those services to address the problems and the needs that they have. So this is a theme that's coming out. And the second theme is the importance of integrity at a board level and that the directors of the provider have the appropriate skills and experience. So uh, in terms of an overview of what I'm looking at today, I'm going to be looking at, uh, to begin with, the constitution of subsidiary companies. I'm going to move on to board structure and composition talk a little bit about the increased liability of directors and finish off with prudential standards and financial reporting. Out of the 150 or so recommendations contained in the report, about 50 deal with governance, so that's a good third. And as I said, I couldn't actually look at all of them, so I'm just picking out the ones that I thought were most significant or most interesting. So let's start off with the first one, which is a constitution of subsidiary companies. This will probably not affect most of you, it really only affects those providers which are a uh, wholly owned subsidiary of another company. And currently in the Corporations Act, there's a fairly important section, which is Section 187, and that basically says that if your company is a subsidiary company, you can quote this section in your constitution, and the effect of that is that a director on your board can act in the best interest of the parent company but still be fulfilling their duties to your subsidiary company so long as what you're doing as a director doesn't result in any sort of insolvency. And that's quite a common section to have if you're a subsidiary company because it provides some protection uh, in the event that your directors are trying to make decisions which are for the benefit of the entire corporate group. The recommendation being put forward by the commissioners is that this particular section of the Corporations Act should not be available to aged care providers, which are subsidiary companies. In my opinion, this was a little bit strange because the commissioners actually did not in the report comment on or uh, find any clear connection between having that section in a constitution and a poor quality of care. So I was sort of a little bit confused as to why they think this would be a good change to make. It's also slightly 
I guess, concerning because it would have the effect of actually removing a statutory power, which otherwise is available to directors of a company. So what exactly are they trying to achieve? I'm not really certain. If they could see a direct link between this section and poor uh, quality and care, I'd actually say, well, let's you know consider this further, but they haven't actually drawn on that at all. So I'm a little bit concerned about this, and some commentators have said if we were to actually go ahead and implement this recommendation, it could impact on the return that investors make within that larger corporate group structure. So I'm not really certain about this one, but nevertheless, it's one of their recommendations, and I guess it's just a case of wait and see. Moving on to the second uh, part of my presentation, board structure and composition. Here we have a number of different recommendations that are put forward. I'm going to focus on the following. We're going to look at their recommendation for independent directors. Then we're going to focus on a proposed new governance standard. And this will include looking at the skills and experience that they're saying directors should have. Uh, we're going to look at their idea of a care governance committee. We're going to consider their suggestion of a feedback system. And finally, the annual attestation, which they think is going to solve a number of problems. And then we're going to finish off with their new fit and proper person test. So let's look at independent directors. Let me go back a slide. So there is a recommendation in the report which says that a majority of the board should be comprised of independent non-executive directors. And the commissioners are saying the actual legislation should be changed to include this requirement. So it's actually going to be a statutory duty to ensure that your board is comprised of independent non-executive directors. Why are they putting this forward as a recommendation? The commissioners think that it is easier to put residents first if most of the directors are not employed by the provider, and so therefore they can be more objective in the decisions that they make. This raises a number of issues. Firstly, we need to have flexibility if this is going to be a statutory duty. Many providers are in remote areas, and of course it would be quite hard for them to find and recruit directors that have no connection to the particular provider. Now, the Royal Commission has said that there should be some sort of exemption process. So if you cannot meet this requirement, you'll be able to put in some sort of application uh, and you would, in that application, explain why it is that you shouldn't be required to comply. And I guess then the regulator would decide whether or not you don't actually need to comply with that or not. Uh, I don't know how this would work. There are a number of issues arising from having to have certain people on your board. And there were some commentators who thought, why should this be a statutory regulation or requirement? Wouldn't it be better just to have some sort of guiding principle, an aspirational uh, principle where providers actually try to comply with this, but if they don't, there aren't any legal consequences. Moving on to the next element, which is this new governance standard that the commissioners are saying should be created. They're saying that this is quite urgent, uh, as they're of the opinion that the current organisational standard in the quality principles is inadequate. So this new governance standard, I'm going to go into what this governance standard would say, would actually form part of the quality standards and would be used to assess if a provider is actually providing quality care. If a provider actually failed to comply with this new governance standards, there would be sanctions uh, and these would be greater than what are currently in place, and I'm going to touch upon that later on. And there seems to be some overlap. Uh, there seems to be some overlap between the proposed governor standard and the current standard. So again, uh, is it really worth doing this? I'm not really certain. But let's go into detail here about what this new governor standard would say. So firstly, uh, the first thing that they look at is. They're saying, this is the commissioners, that the board should have a mix of skills, experience and knowledge of governance. So this is going to be a requirement going forward. And obviously, not only would the board be required to have that particular mix, but also the board would have to review this annually to ensure that they don't uh, appear well, they don't uh, have any gaps that appear throughout the year, and if they do, they'd have the opportunity to address those gaps and bring in the necessary skills or experience or knowledge that is missing. The commissioners did look at whether or not it should be mandatory for the board to have a director who has some sort of clinical experience or expertise, and they said that this would probably be too impractical, and so they moved away from that. 
What sort of issues do we have with this particular uh, part of the governor's standard? One, it may be hard to actually find and remunerate these sorts of directors. I have seen in the not-for-profit sector that there has been a very slow move to remunerating or paying directors to obviously be able to attract that high calibre of people that we want to have on our boards. Uh, but do you actually have a, a list of skills or, or expertise or qualifications that you need to tick off on? I think will make that much harder. Uh, despite the fact that the Royal Commission said that it would be too hard if we made it a requirement to actually have the clinical expertise at a board level, many of the cases and the stories that came through the Royal Commission actually showed that the poor quality of care was a direct result of not having that clinical expertise at a board level. Uh, the Royal Commission did not actually list any particular qualifications, so how would a board know whether or not the list that it has created is actually adequate or appropriate? And finally, the AICD commented on this and said, really, boards should have the flexibility to decide themselves what is appropriate, what sort of skills they need, uh, you know, each board really has enough common sense to work out what it's missing and what sort of people it needs to attract or retain uh, to be able to have a fully qualified board. The next element of this particular new governance standard is the Care Governance Committee. And this is where the Royal Commission says that it should be mandatory to have this Care Governance Committee and the committee should be chaired by a non-executive member. So I guess the commissioners are looking at having some sort of independence at that committee level. But at least one person on this committee should have some clinical experience. So the commissioners are saying it'd be lovely to have that experience at a board level. We think that would be too hard. But if the board set up this care governance committee and the experience was at the committee level, we think that that should suffice. The role of this new committee would be to monitor and report to the board on the quality and the safety of the services being provided, and also to ensure that there are effective procedures in place if issues arise, so that those issues could be appropriately addressed. The Care Governance Committee, which is being recommended, would consider a broader range of factors in the existing Clinical Care Committee. The Clinical Care Committee, which many providers currently have, focuses more on physical health metrics, but this proposed Care Governance Committee would look beyond just the physical and would also consider emotional and mental factors of each resident to see whether those particular needs are being addressed. The next element of the new governance standard is a feedback system. And the commissioners are saying that we really need to have a clear process for not only receiving feedback, but obviously also implementing feedback. They found that there were four poor complaints handling processes across the sector, and this was a fairly serious issue. Of course, it's bad enough if the quality of care being delivered is poor, but if then there's a very inefficient or incompetent system to actually pick up on those issues and address them, that obviously exacerbates the problem. Two ideas here. Obviously, there'll be many, many ideas about how to actually uh, implement the system, what that system would look like, but some of the commentary that has come out since the report was handed down have been that uh, it would be a good idea to have a committee and have on that committee actual people who are residents. So those residents actually have an opportunity at a committee level to put forward any problems or issues that they're experiencing themselves or they've seen happening amongst their fellow residents. And in the hearings, uh, those who actually did have that sort of system said that they felt empowered to be able to actually uh, provide that feedback. Other suggestions have been for the board to walk the floor where they actually go out and, and meet the residents and talk to them. And apparently a very successful system has been where board members actually stay the night uh, within the facility. So they experience firsthand what it's like to actually live in the facility. Uh, another idea is this annual attestation where one particular director on the board is actually required to make an annual attestation on behalf of the board about how the board is actually uh, delivering on the new requirements in terms of care. The director chosen would actually be personally liable for the views in the statement. So obviously that gives the director some sort of protection. Uh, the statement would actually form part of the assessment of the provider and the, and the commission is saying that this statement should be made public. A couple of issues here, to whom would this statement actually be delivered? We don't know, maybe the quality regulator. 
I think that the idea behind the statement is somehow to force the board to turn its mind to the quality of care that it's providing, but there is a risk that it's just can become like a ticker box exercise and they'll tick off and issue the statement but not really care about whether or not they're providing quality and care and whether they could be improving on that. Uh, fit and proper person test, this would replace the disqualified individuals test. Key personnel would be directors and managers, and this test would be broader than the current disqualified persons test. The disqualified persons test is quite negative in that it lists qualities or attributes or factors that a potential key personnel should not have, whereas this is a much more positive test where it actually lists the attributes, competencies, and skills that a person should have. So hopefully this would actually improve the quality of people being hired uh, to the organisation or being recruited to the board. And on this slide, I've just listed some of the things that would be considered in that fit and proper person test. Let's move on to increase director liability. The commissioners are recommending a new high quality and safe care duty, and this duty would apply in the first instance to the aged care provider. You can see on the screen the nature of that new duty. The thing that strikes me is that it's non-delegable and amongst all the different duties that apply to organisations and directors, most are delegable. So the fact that this is non-delegable means that the commissions are really saying you've got to take responsibility at board level, you can't sort of push this down the food chain to uh, personnel and expect them to take responsibility if things aren't actually happening. Two elements I want to focus on here. The first is that they're saying, this is the commissioners, that we actually really need a new act to replace the Aged Care Act, and this new duty that they've put forward would actually be part of that new act. The new duty is emphasising the health, the wellbeing, and the safety of residents. This is a bit of a shift from the current Aged Care Act, which really focuses more on service providers and funding. And although there is a reference in the current act to the quality of care that's needed, which is contained in the quality of care principles. There really weren't any sanctions if those uh, particular principles were breached. What the commissioners are saying is we need a new act and the new act needs to move away a little bit from a focus on the providers and really focus again on the residents. So we go back to this resident centric approach. And if the new duty is breached, we need to have more serious sanctions, which I'll get to in a second. Another element uh, of this new duty is the duty on labour hire firms. So I think what the commissioners found was that many of the people hired to actually provide the personal care to residents were hired through labour hire firms, many of them online, and the labour hire firms really took no uh, great interest in the quality of the people uh, that it was making available to the providers. So the Aged Care Commission said with labour hire firms subsidised by government, they really do need to have a duty to ensure that the workers that they're putting forward actually have the appropriate qualifications, skills and training. And they need to take some interest in the actual quality of care being provided by those people. So these labour hire firms, which are subsidised by the government, would actually have to carry out some form of investigation to see whether or not the people they're putting forward are actually doing a good job. At the moment, they really don't take much interest in it at all. And so therefore, these contractors who are providing services to the residents aren't really under the control of anyone, including the provider, and this inevitably leads to poor quality care. The question is that if such a duty is imposed on these labour hire firms, does it really make their business unviable? And so therefore, they're just going to slowly start moving out of the industry. Now, sanctions for directors. The commissioners are saying in relation to this new duty that they've put forward, if the directors have found to have aided, abetted or not only concerned in harming uh, or of giving right and sorry, concerned in harming or what they did gave rise to a foreseeable risk of harming a person receiving aged care and doing so breached the quality standards, the directors themselves would be personally liable and they would be uh, exposed to certain civil penalties. Uh, this would mean that residents or their families could actually sue directors directly, personally, if they could establish that the care being provided was substandard and the directors were actually aware of it and didn't do anything about it. The commentary that's come out uh, has been to the effect that this is probably a little bit too punitive for directors. 
the duty here would be higher than the duty imposed on directors in other sectors. It's going to make it harder to recruit directors. Most directors in aged care providers are volunteers, they're not paid. And so to now say to them, by the way, we want you to join our board. We're not, we're not paying you. Uh, and if you actually are found to have breached this particular duty, you'll be personally liable for the penalties. I think it's going to be much harder to recruit directors. And by the way, they've got to be independent and non-executive. So why would a person join the board? If they did join the board, there are resulting questions of the indemnities, DNO insurance and the like. To what extent is all of this going to protect the director if they actually get sued? Moving on to prudential uh, standards and financial reporting, and I'm nearly finished. Uh, the Commission is recommending that a new prudential regulator be created, which would either be the Department of Health, which should now be called the Department of Health and Aged Care, or that there be an Aged Care Commission. They are recommending that prudential reform be much more comprehensive in terms of the reporting that's required of providers and that that reporting be much more timely. Why are they putting this forward? They have formed the opinion that the financial performance across the sector has deteriorated significantly in recent years. Not surprising, given that the funding has decreased and the cost of providing these services has increased. Some of the recommendations that are being considered would be requiring providers to give more financial detail about their corporate structures, to report on changes to those structures and ownership. So one could imagine even changes to the constitution could be caught. Uh, they'd have to meet a liquidity threshold. They'd have to hold a certain level of net assets to support their ongoing viability. They'd have to provide more transparent information on the management of their resident accommodation deposits and also report changes that put them at risk of not delivering services, et cetera. So some fairly significant changes, which I think we need to scrutinise quite carefully to see whether or not they're actually going to deliver on their intent or whether they're just going to be too burdensome for most providers. The commissioners have also recommended an increase in the powers of this regulator. The regulator would be able to conduct inquiries regarding the finances of a provider, enter onto the premises of the provider without a warrant or consent, and also to examine documents and uh, the goods of the provider. Issues arising here is if the regulator has increased powers, how does this adversarial and punitive approach actually foster the trust that the commissioners are saying really should be um, a focus going forward between the regulator and providers. Something to think about uh, if we're going to try to establish a better relationship between providers and regulators. The commissioner, uh, sorry, the commissioners are also recommending continuous disclosure requirements where Providers must inform the prudential regulator if they become aware of material information which is not defined uh, concerning their ability to pay their debts or if something's going to happen which is going to impact on their ability to continue to provide services. This means providers have to self-monitor much more closely. Uh, again, an additional cost, I think. Commentary on this particular issue has been to the effect, well, providing more information isn't always necessarily better. Uh, what more information do you need? How much is that going to cost to provide that information? We really need to be much more specific about what sort of information is needed rather than just saying provide us with more information. I think as it is, providers are struggling with their obligations and to say you've got to now give us more information will actually be a negative result rather than a positive one. So I'm going to finish there and hand over to Louise. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm going to take a slightly different tack. I'm going to focus in on resourcing. And given the time available, I'm going to keep it quite narrow and I'm going to talk to you about workforce issues and what does that look like and what have the commissioners come up with in relation to workforce issues and why am I focusing in on that because in the end whatever money we spend whatever action we take and whatever governance we put in place the service to our older Australians is all going to depend on the people who are employed to provide to care for them and provide for them 
And as we can see from that, from the quote from Commissioner Briggs, she's very much talked about being starved of, of funds, that it's commonplace. And, with, and once you're starved of funds, the resources suffer. You don't have the resources then to, pr to provide high quality and safe aged care. So I'm going to have a look at the Royal Commission gives us, um, has, a, has identified several specific issues. And then it's also given us a vision for the future, which I've uh, coined as aged care as a profession. And I'm, I, from my point of view, there are, there are four main areas of focus in relation to achieving this vision for the future. And they are training, credentialing, wages and staff ratios, and retention. So they're, they're the headings I'm going to look at. So if we look at what are the current issues, apart from the, the matters that um, Luke and Vera have identified, we can identify them really as there are not enough staff. The, the mix of staff is not matched to the care needs of the older people they're looking after. The proportion of qualified staff uh, is too low. The level of personal care providers is too high, so those with lower uh, area, areas of uh, levels of expertise. And this is at a time when we have an increasing, increasing complexity of people receiving aged care, and it's not being reflected in the staff mix. In fact, I would argue that the current funding system actually encourages the opposite to be the case. And ultimately, in the end, the staff don't feel valued and supported. So, and this is at a this is at a stage where we have a looming issue of the, of an aging population. This is a this is a looming crisis, and and Luke gave you some uh, uh, some statistics around that. But just to remind you, uh, we're expecting the people aged between sixty five and sixty nine years will increase by one third from twenty. 20 to 2050, and in the same period, there'll also be an increase of, of the number of people who are 85 years and older. And that's coupled with, um, just as a reminder, that the, that the uh, people at 85 years, we can expect one in three of us to be suffering from dementia. Uh, and that's a good reason as to why dementia has received some special uh, treatment and, and attention in the actual Royal Commission report. And this is all coming at a time when our ability to actually attract and retain a skilled aged care workforce is decreasing. So, and the effect of poor resources is clear for all to see. It basically results in substandard care and just a, you know, a, a couple of uh, ideas in a couple of um, statistics. Um, 22 to 50% of people in residential aged care are thought to be malnourished. 75 to 81% of people suffering incontinence, which is poorly managed, including, as we saw in some of the reporting, for example, toileting pads being rationed. Pressure injuries occurring in one third of the most frail residents and um, nursing standards would basically say that, that there is no excuse for pressure inj injuries occurring, and yet we see them in our aged care system. 61% of our, of our aged care uh, residents are receiving um, some type of psychotropic agent. And ultimately what that all leads to is abuse. And as Luke referred to, the, the Commissioner Briggs considers that potentially one in, one in three of our uh, aged care residents have been abused in some way. So the key challenge for the future then is to look at creating an aged, a larger aged care workforce with the right skills and attributes to be able to look after our growing population, which is living longer. And again, from our, uh, from our, the Royal Commission, that aged care quality and safety is directly dependent on the number and quality of the people who provide it. So I've come up with what I consider to be a, a, a bit of a, a circle or a, a positive cycle, if we get it right, of training, credentialing, wages and retention. And if we get those right, then we'll attract the right staff. We will be able to uh, improve our governance and efficiency 
we'll, we'll have quality of service and we'll ultimately have better leadership. So if we look at training, Aged care workers need to have good quality and easily accessible ongoing training and professional development opportunities. And currently there is no formal industry standard for entry level qualification to work as a personal care worker. And so, for example, in 2016, 67% of personal care workers in residential aged care settings held a relevant certificate level three qualification, and that's all they held. So if we're looking at what training might look like, there's a mandatory, the, the Commission has decided that mandatory minimum training is an essential part of assuring that we have the provision of high quality care. There was some discussion as to whether that would form a barrier to entry, but in the end, the Commission has fallen on the side of actually requiring a minimum standard to ensure that our older Australians are looked after appropriately. And they particularly picked out specialist training, so not just a general level of training, but specialist training in dementia care, specialist training in relation to cultural backgrounds, diversity, food and nutrition, the use of restricted, pal of, of restricted practices uh, such as psychotropics and palliative care as matters that where there should be specific training in relation to those, into those areas. And I've just picked out for you there on that slide the recommendations that I think are, are, are focused on those. So there's the recommendation 78 for certificate three mandatory minimum qualification, recommendation 15 for the establishment of uh, dementia support pathways, and uh, 16 which talks about specialist dementia care services. Recommendation 80 in relation to regular training in palliative care and regulation, uh, recommendation 51 which is related to specialist training in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander care, just as an example of those of those of those many uh, of the 148 recommendations. Those are the ones that I've pulled out as being focused on that area. The next area is credentialing, and really, inappropriate personal care worker practice compounded with clinical with poor clinical supervision and we've talked and we've seen how clinical supervision has been raised to director uh, to the board level uh, in terms of some of the government's requirements that we has talked about uh, present a serious risk to the health and safety of those receiving aged care and one and the other side of that not having somewhere where people can go and complain to if they feel that there is something not 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 being um, appropriately looked at, appropriately done so if we look at you know, the regulation of personal care workers by, regi by registration, a mandatory minimum qualification requirement, ongoing, ongoing training requirements, a code of conduct and a complaint process will all work together to help professionalise and improve the quality of the personal care workforce. And if we look at a particular recommendation in this area, I've, I've pulled out recommendation 77, which talks about the national registration scheme for personal care workforce. And I've also pulled out recommendation 81 uh, in, regarding ongoing professional development of the aged care workforce and recommendation 82, uh, which, which talks about the review of the health professions undergraduate curricula, which isn't matched with uh, what is actually required in the uh, aged care system. I'm going to move along a little quicker now because I can see the time, but if we're talking about wages, and this really must be one of the uh, big issues that came out of the Royal Commission. So both commissioners considered that, the, that Australia's aged care is understaffed and the workforce underpaid and undertrained. And for example, if we look at registered nurses, that the workforce dropped from 21% in 2003 to just under 15% in 2016, and enrolled nurses dropped from 13% to just on 10%. And in the same time, we've had uh, the less qualified personal care worker representation increasing from 58% to 70% of the workforce. 
So if we're looking at uh, you know, what's going on, we've got skilled shortages and difficulties in filling positions. We've got staff being underpaid. We've got staff not paid more for additional skill sets, so no reason to put themselves out to try and uh, obtain, uh, to become more skilled. And funding models, as, as I had alluded to in the past uh, in, uh, previously, that I think potentially encourage minimum requirements. So the recommendations that I pulled out that I think ad are addressing these two issues uh, these, this issue is recommendation 84, which talks about varying wage rates to reflect the work value of the aged care employee. And recommendation 85, which talks specifically about improved remuneration for aged care workers. I've also called out recommendation 86, which requires that at least, at least, and these are the ratios, this was the other big area, or I might think I've gone too far. This is the other big area uh, that was addressed by the Royal Commission that uh, at least one registered nurse on site at all times, there's a graded approach to that, but by July 24, that is to be the standard, according to the Commission. Minimum staff time standards to be put in place, graded up to a, a, a per, a 215 minutes per resident per day with at least 44 minutes from a registered nurse, again by um, July 2024. And that's all to be linked to a case mix adjusted activity based funding model to try and encourage that to occur. And if we have staff being paid and valued appropriately, then surely that will mean that we'll actually be able to retain the staff that we need. The workforce will not stay in aged care if on a, if the day to, if day to day the system in which they work is inadequately funded, doesn't have the right incentives, doesn't pay them enough, and doesn't actually provide them with a with a pathway to promotion and improvement. And there you'll see my summary of why I think it's hard, why the matters that I think the Royal Commission have identified as why we're not actually retaining our staff. And the recommendations that I pull out in relation to retention of staff, uh, recommendation 75, these are probably two of the um, most important recommendations, I think. The establishment of an aged care workforce planning department, that's to be done by January next year, which will actually look at long-term workforce modelling, consultation on training and development so that we can, and so that we can achieve uh, career pathways and that we can achieve appropriate distribution across regional, rural and remote areas. And I've just noticed the slide has slipped off, but recommendation 76 uh, basically goes hand in hand with recommendation 75. And recommendation 76 is all about the establishment of an aged care workforce industry council. That is to happen by July this year. Where, which again will focus on career paths and development opportunities for the aged care workforce. And finally, just to summarise, in, in my view, if we address these four main issues, I think we can achieve attraction of people to the aged care system, an improvement in quality of service, increased efficiencies and better governance frameworks, and finally, and most importantly, from my point of view, leadership that recognises aged care as a human right. Thank you. Luke, I'm all not right. sure. I wasn't I'll sure if you were going to say that's all right. Thanks, Louise. Thanks, Vera. Um, look, we've been talking uh, for an hour now, and there's a lot of information people have received. Uh, can I just see if there's anyone who had a question uh, that they wanted to raise and for any of the three of us? If not, that's okay. Um, the, I guess the, 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 the takeaway from this commission is, you know, we, we, we've seen we've seen, a, we've seen we've seen three royal commissions happening concurrently. We saw the aged care, we saw the disability, and we saw the bushfires. The disability royal commission is very much focused on violence, abuse, neglect, and exploitation, much like um, the child abuse royal commission several years ago was. This one, however, was deliberately focused on quality and safety. And I think the the two things that come out of this commission that both Vera and Louise uh, touched on and, and that I was talking about earlier uh, are that there is 
clearly an assessment that the system is broken, fundamentally broken, and uh, that it needs to be recast entirely. And I don't think that that's necessarily an indictment on any one individual uh, government or one individual provider, but rather that um, the priorities of Australia as a country have to change. And so I guess we'll see what uh, happens when the government decides how to apply the budget in May. So we'll be uh, arranging a, a discussion forum with some sector experts uh, shortly, I think, after the budget is announced to further dive into these issues. And we will certainly include all of you on the invitation list for that when we have some more details. In the meantime, thanks everyone for being part of the session today. We'll get a copy of the recording out to you, as well as the slides and uh, some of the other extracts from the Royal Commission's final report on email, hopefully this afternoon, and if not today, certainly on Monday. Thanks again for being here with us and have a wonderful weekend. Bye.